night in prayer. Almighty and eternal Father, we come to thee as thy children, and thankfully we can say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Also, knowing that you have taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And conscious of our responsibility as a part of thy household, in building and working for thy kingdom, we pray that you shall grant unto us an understanding of the situations in which we find ourselves. Cause us to recognize into our environment have come in factors that must be removed, situations in crisis that continue to produce problems for thy nations. Teach us to recognize the authority and the direction of thy word, of thy guidance, and of thy law. Grant unto us, O God, that we shall fulfill thy responsible charges. Teach us to come out and be separate and not be joined to the powers of darkness and the forces of evil and these unassimilatable powers which at this hour are seeking to engulf us. Grant unto us a realization of our destiny as we establish thy kingdom with righteousness and with law from one end of the earth to the other. It causes us to recognize in order to accomplish our objectives, we must stand strong, tall, and free before thee. We pray thy blessing to rest upon the spiritual center of the nations of thy kingdom, the church, and upon our own nation as a great part of the nations of thy kingdom. We pray, our Father, that this hour we shall assume our responsibilities as Christians and as good citizens in establishing thy standards in this great nation of thy building. Praying, our Father, that we shall break the bonds and the fetters that they are trying to put upon us in this hour and that we shall raise up a great standard of leadership before the nations by example and by purpose, that we might stand free and strong in this hour of the great trial of the nations of thy kingdom. And as we survey these situations before us, we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and then we ask it. Amen. Amen. Tonight we are talking about areas of a old conspiracy, but yet a new one, redeveloping with each new attempt upon the part of those that would enslave America and the great Christian nations with new strategies and with new approaches, but always following the many-pointed attack against the great nations of God's kingdom. More especially is this directed against this great nation at this hour than probably any other time in the history of our own experience have we been in such great danger. When I talk about this danger, it is not without the knowledge of inevitable destiny. I am not overlooking the prophecies that relate to our survival nor our abilities to throw off uh, the conspiratorial design to destroy us. But we point it out because if ever there was a time for Christians to stand up and be counted, if ever there was a time when it becomes your business and mine to resist and resist now, it is at this time. Because if this objective, which is a part of the objective of our enemies, were put over, we are going to be faced with unusual and unique crisis. When we announced this subject last week, we had little knowledge that in the minds of about 12 or 15 other people across the United States, the same thing was dawning. When we received our intelligence digests in several sources on Wednesday and Thursday this week, and I found them here when I arrived in Colorado, I found they also were supporting the same situation. In fact, one of the more conservative writers, though an accurate writer, made a statement which we uh, will quote from his own bulletin, which is rather significant, and I point this out to you. He says that if the Senate approves the Trade Expansion Act, Americans before long will be facing this grim choice. Either they will have to revolt against the international tyranny now being foisted on them by their own government, or they will have to give up meekly and abandon forever the freedom and independence which our forefathers fought for by, uh, by their glorious devotion to high ideals. Now, when as conservative and as accurate a writer as Dan Smoots tells you that if the United States Senate passes the Trade Expansion Act Bill of 1962, that either we're going to have to fight a revolting revolution against the powers in our government taking away our liberties, or we're going to surrender our liberty and go down the road to socialist slavery forever. Now, I point this out because this is a situation which we were announcing last Sunday night. We were going to talk on a little noise that this and about a half a dozen other digests arriving this week were counting in similar phrases because the pressure was on. We were notified several uh, weeks ago that the pressure was being built up and the most unprecedented pressure that has ever been applied on the senators in the United States Senate has been taking place over the last two weeks. There has been a long design to engulf America inside an international or socialist world government. 
This program is aimed directly at you because your nation is the strongest, most powerful nation in the great Western nations of the free world. And as far as its ability to produce and as far as its ability to establish assembly lines of weapons in areas which make the defeat or the conquest of our nation a rather hard one, or that of any nation or allies, it has been designed by our enemies to knock out America first. A thorough knowledge of geopolitics is just as vital to you as to any other peoples on the face of the earth. It is a realization that the nations of the Western world are a bulwark against the expansion all over the world of world communism. But especially is this true of the geopolitical heart centers as they are termed by students of geopolitics all over the world. It's a recognized fact, and let's face it, that the technological and manufacturing and economic development in the areas of production of either heavy weapons or the necessary commodities for the survival of society in the Western nations of the Western world or in the free white half of the earth are located in the United States and in Germany. That's one of the reasons why the design was to try to destroy the ruler, to dive out and break the power of the industrial strength of Germany, and to knock ours out jointly in World War II. This, of course, was a war that originally was designed by the enemies of Christianity and by international worldwide Jewry for the purpose of trying to enslave the entire white race, hoping to destroy both of these areas of resistance and reduce us to an area of inability to survive. Now, we're not going into all the technicalities that arise in the struggles and the conditions that were the foundation of such a war, but we point out that the design was to knock out the geopolitical heart centers from which the assistance, the areas of resistance, the military strength by uh, competitive standards uh, uh, with the rest of the world would find itself located in these two areas. And quite successfully during that war, a most devastating program of knocking out the heart center of Germany occurred and the most devastating program of shouldering a tremendous economic burden upon the peoples of this nation was accomplished. And under any normal standards, one would say, uh, that Germany could never come back and America could never dig itself out of its economic chaos. Now one would say, well, we saw prosperity, but it was all built on imaginary money and on a debt sat status. And the fact remains that the burden of this program was considered to be so great that the communist world expected daily that our economy was going to fold. Well, the fact remains that since that time, the Western world has been bolstered by the decisions of the uh, nations of the Western world to try to remain free, to oppose communism, to denounce its tyranny. And they looked upon this great nation as a powerful force in helping to maintain it. And of course, as far as the standards and the programs were concerned, America not only financed it, but extended this beyond any other uh, area of the earth. Now. We point out to you that the program to engulf America, to destroy its greatness in a conspiratorial design, reduce you to an de de interdependent society inside of a world socialist society, uh, was a part of the master design of the merchants of Babylon. Now, we have referred in the past to the merchants of Babylon. The merchants of Babylon are the international world banking force and financial internationalists that move from country to country, that don't consider any country their own, but the world is the world they intend to master. And they gravitate from one part of the world to the other while they hold a religious center in Palestine and call this a state to which they all have a right to adhere while operating in processes of dual allegiance and international intrigue and espionage all over the world. We point out to you that the design that they have levied against you since World War II, though it has its earlier foundations, has been an economic program, a political program, a military program, and even a religious invasion. With these many pronged assaults against your society, they have been trying to wipe out and destroy uh, the resistance of your nation to the design of surrendering to an international world socialist state over which you would have nothing to say, and representatives selected by you would have nothing to say, but appointed authority, soon delegated by this world state and its international bankers themselves, would determine the destiny of every individual upon this globe. Now, this is the program that the Bible denounces. I can show you that even John, a disciple of Christ, that, as we know, on the Isle of Patmos received his unique experiences, uh, was told that such a period would come and that all the powers of darkness and forces of evil would try to put over this world political uh, system called the beast system, and it would seek to de deceive the peoples of earth, and it tells us here uh, that power would be given unto it till no man could buy nor sell except to be with his mark or with his provision or with his number. 
In other words, the prophecies would reach so far that life and death powers would soon be invested in such a world government, but all economic life and all the economy of the nations of the world would be subject to this power if they pass under its system or if they become a part of it. No wonder also, being enmeshed in the early developments of such a system, that John again, inspired by the revelation which Christ gave to him to give to you, declares in the 18th chapter of Revelation, Come out of her, my people, and receive not thou her sins and her plagues. Come out of her now, because God Almighty said it has got to go down, and it's got to be destroyed. And I'm going to tell you that when it falls, it's going to be the kingdom of God that's going to replace it. Now I point out to you that this strategy is to bind men and to take away their liberties and freedoms, to take away the liberty of their nations and the freedoms for which it stands. In this attack, we note that they start out, of course, with uh, the great promise that it's absolutely essential in this time, with a political threat, uh, that a nation won't long survive unless it become a part of a great international world political program. In fact, the pressure and the propaganda that comes to our desk and is being circulated among clergy and uh, moves into the areas of people in every walk of public life and descends upon congressmen and senators is being stepped up. Such literature continues to flow through the mail and demonstrates that from a myriad sources of some 15 or 20 organizations, the pressure is completely and altogether on at this moment. Now, one of the highlights of this strategy is to try to cite that because of the tremendous nuclear crisis of this time, because of the abilities of small nations that are suddenly power mad to hurl a nuclear holocaust and war that could wipe out great nations and destroy masses of earth, the time has come when we must surrender our political independence and our national sovereignty to become a part of some international organization and world government program which would place the authority for the political direction and the policing action in the hands of a super state to guarantee us all the fact that we would have a right to live and could expect this under this program. Now, of course, this is not the position for a great Christian nation, nor is it for any nation in the household of God's kingdom who told us that we were not to fear nations because we suspected that they might be more powerful than we were, but we were to recognize that there was a certain divine factor that was supplied to us in which God said, I will bring unto you victory and I'll deliver these powers of darkness into your hand. He says, let me take you by the hand, Jacob. He said, I'll take you by the hand and you can walk with me. Now listen, never have the Jacob's sons or the Saxons and the peoples today of the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Nordic, Basque, Lombard, Germanic peoples of earth ever been in such a period of crisis as they are now. We have oft made the numeric comparison of the fact that you're one-sixth of the world's population and the powers of darkness and its political world beast system stirs five-sixths of the world and thus outnumbers you six to one and desire to rule over you. But we are told the only way that we could survive the present crisis without a nuclear holocaust that's going to wipe out millions of people, maybe over a billion of them before it's through, is to surrender our independence and then put our heads right in the mouth of the monster and be controlled and outnumbered by the five-sixths of the world that are against us. This, my friends, is not the way they express it when they tell you that the hope of the world is the immediate integration of all of the individual nations into such a program. I think that we can go back to the 4th of July speech of infamy in which the President of the United States suggested that we surrender our independence to become a part of a program of international interdependence with other nations, working up to the objective of becoming a part of an international world uh, federation of nations and challenged us to have the same courage our forefathers had when they formed the United States to now form a United States of the world. It not only demonstrated that he gave assent to it, but let's go back to last year when they were starting on the program of trying to bring to fruition in the next 13 months, which involves this year, this strategy. In fact, it was last July uh, that none other than President Eisenhower, uh, former President Eisenhower, sent his congratulations to the United World Federalists. And he said, I want you to know that I'm heartily in support with your programs and your objectives. And he said, I uh, hope that we can soon work out with all of the leaders and conference everywhere a program of world federal government. And we're not to overlook the United Nations and the framework already set up. But let's work with it and let's improve it. And let's create this eventual evolution of our day, a great super world government. This is Mr. Eisenhower's program for last year 
showing that uh, he was wrong when he was president. He's just as wrong as he today, even though he finds it to his uh, policy to travel around and appear to be more conservative than he used to be. Well, the fact remains that just demonstrates how far the influence and power of these advisors seeking to subordinate our independence and our national greatness have gone in influencing the men they surround. I believe that the most highly trained group of political hypnotists in the world are moving in the areas and vicinity of leadership chosen by this nation. I believe also that you have not as much to do with the choosing of your leadership as you think, for behind the, sa- the scenes there is shuffled in place and position for your selection men which they know they can control and direct regardless of who is elected. And under this instance, we discover that the massive program has a political front. And that political front is to operate on fear. Remember this tonight. The enemy that wants to conquer you wants to prey on your fears, always fears. There are four fears, just as, as there are four areas uh, which they approach. And one of these is that you will not be able to survive as a people, that you're going to be blown off the face of the earth unless you join a program of world government and submit your areas of armament to their control. Now let's go into the military program. In the military program, they tell us that because we have reached the point where we are now dependent on other nations, because all the defenses of a great free world are predicated upon an interlocking military design. They tell us since this is so, America can no longer defend itself because it's already committed and financially pledged to help the entire world. Because of this, therefore, our defense is integrated with the defense of every other Western nation and nations that do not belong in our Western orbit. And since we have created this tremendous juggernaut of military power, it is cited that our enemy has also created power infinitely spread out in greater detail than ours, and the only way we can survive is if now all the nations of the world form a great world government and subject the military activities of all of the military defenses of the United States into a world military program in which we would subordinate the decisions of any branch or department of the American military to the decision of the world program. Now, I have a great number of the uh, propaganda lines that they wanted passed out and directed even by the church to soften people up and to get them to be willing to surrender the military position of their nation. A great number of those inside the Pentagon, some civilian and some walk taken over among the military, have been supporting the policies of integrating the military program of all the nations that are supposed to be on our side, and eventually all nations into a world military program governed by world government, United Nations, and a greater, more expanded design than we have tonight. Now let me point this out to you. As we have recently reported to you, and way back when it happened, had called your attention, when the United Nations was formed, infamous and satanic as was the design directed by Alger Hiss and by his communist advisors and his international financiers, the program called at that time for the fact that the policing action and the military activities of the United Nations would always be in the hands of a Soviet officer. And from that day to this, Every campaign, every military program, every police action has been in the hands of a Soviet military officer and is today inside the United Nations. Which is every reason why this great Christian nation in following the directives of God should get out of the United Nations and we should wash our hands of any association with this satanic institution. military campaign is being stepped up in the design to sell your representatives in every walk of your national life to the support of integrating all of our military activity with that of the developing world government is now more and more self-evident. We are being asked to intervene and we as a nation find our political leadership in the hands of the president and Mr. Rusk and others are supporting the supreme Soviet desire. We are now trying to pressure and subordinate the Tanga province into joining with the rest of the Congo, which is a communist objective. We find ourselves by pressure subordinating Britain and France and other nations that wanted no part with this colonial interference into the same design. We find ourselves pressuring the surrender of the white man to all areas of the earth where under his guidance and under his leadership, under his civilizing influence, all the progress of the last century have been made. 
Now you say, why are we doing this? Because we are told, and tomorrow's newspaper tells you the story, that America is going to join with the United Nations in implementing the action into forcing Katanga province into the Congo and to become a part of what would be a socialist, communist-dominated state. Now, none of these principles are the principles supported by the majority of the people of these United States. Maybe that gives some substance to what Dan Smoots replies when he says if one area of this thing goes through, the only solution is revolution or you won't have any liberty. Now let's take a look at the picture. Every instance you'll discover that we have been subordinated to world military councils. Ever since we got into the world government trap in uh, World War, uh, uh, after World War II, we have been unable to direct our forces to victory. Inside of Korea, we twice were brought to a stalemate. We, end, we ended with a very sad relationship. In fact, one of the uh, situations is that General Taylor, now head of our uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, was the man who presided in the last hours over the conference at Huanyang, in which we, at that spot, uh, surrendered whole areas of uh, rights which were ours, and we operated at eventually a stalemate right back where the communists started their war in Korea. All that you expended and all the energies and all the monies, monies greater than all the monies expended by all the previous administrations of America, had gone down a Korean rat hole without one bit of victory because behind the scenes the Russians were calling every one of the moves. So the design is a prong program to tell you that you could not survive America if you did not interrelate your military program with all the other nations of the world. Now, I'm going to tell you this, that America could survive, and America would survive better and easier if it suddenly declared its military independence from every other sphere upon the face of the earth. You may not think that's true. I'm not talking about an unwillingness to assist in the defense of Christian people and free nations. But I'm talking about the fact of the necessity of maintaining America's military machine utterly independent of any foreign crying power that has been unable to produce as much for itself or by its very designs are seeking to destroy yours. Every once in a while someone seeks to break down the resistance of our society by trying to tell us that to maintain a powerful military establishment is unmoral. Well, if it is, they're a little late because God Almighty has told us that we better start beating our plowshares back into spears and our, sword and our pruning hooks back into swords because we're going to need them. The time has come when we must be realists concerning the objectives for which we have been placed in the earth. Now, all of these are a sad commentary on the fact that this pack is going on. It's being financed by tremendous amounts of money. We have the United World Federalists of the Union now and a great number of other organizations and one of the great New World Constitutionalists is now uh, one of the great new organizations. In fact, it's just developed and it's going to have a conference in just a couple of months and they're holding a great one at Geneva and the president's for it and all the branches of, of internationalism and all the supporters of the treason that would surrender our independence is for it. And right now, the new frontier is embracing this as one of the last great designs for the final pr production and they're going to gather together, reframe constitutions and revamp the United Nations and create an institution with more authority and more power and we're all supposed to go hip hip hooray and move into it and surrender our independence right now. Now let's go to the religious front. The same strategy is moving upon the religious front by a continual bombardment of pacifist literature. This pacifist literature comes under a dozen different names. It talks about the great economic and food problem of the earth. It comes to us tied with the programs of the miseries of people from past wars. There are moving displaced persons going from place to place, not yet being able to be assimilated in these populations, become the burden for the modern world. And then they approach the church that is to be filled with great love for all mankind that they now interpret for us our responsibility to see that selfish nationalisms and selfish divisions of national boundaries and lines must not come in conflict with our greater God-given dignities and our concepts of the values of the human soul. And then they proceed to tell us why uh, we should translate this beginning to uh, uh, 
of spiritual foundation in history, as they call it, uh, by consummating it with a great program of God and of all scriptures, they said, and of all Bibles and of all faiths to make the world one great harmonious place to dwell. And therefore they call on every clergyman to lead in a program of adjusting his people and influencing his people so that their voices could be heard in all the halls of the parliaments of man to bring together such a super state. Now, who's paying for all this? Where does it come from? Almost every one of these sheets coming out of these fronts can be traced back to international financial Jewish machines whose foundations and whose cartels are directing this propaganda, not interested one fig in the welfare of anybody on the face of the earth, but seeking by these honey phrases to get you to surrender your independence, your liberty, and your sovereignty so they can hold the whole earth in pawn. Within its structure, I point out to you some of the most dangerous elements that were involved in this situation. The recent framework of last year's design, which is being advanced in this great program for the world constitution of the world government, which is being designed, starts with world federalism's concepts of last year's conference uh, that Mr. Eisenhower congratulates. The essentialness of limiting all the armaments of man must take place. The program for complete disarmament, abandonment of all weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, super weapons, and conventional weapons. The control of all weapons and the maintenance of all weapons in the hands only of a regulated international world peace force will bring about security to every individual. The confiscation of all weapons, uh, uh, whether they be considered uh, uh, weapons to be used by armies or whether they be weapons in the hands of individuals are outlined by this program for confiscation on the part of this great program. Now they send all this propaganda in and they expect that the preachers are going to be a lot of sob sisters that are going to buy this stuff. And unfortunately, about 60% of them do. They start telling about the fact that if they could thus establish the control over all the instruments by which men fight a war, the world then would be secure. There would be no violence, there would be no trouble, even murder would cease and robbery would cease and everything would become a most peaceful area. The only thing, my friends, that's quite evident is that you'd be at the mercy of this international outlaw army of the United Nations. And I don't know of anything more dangerous than being at the hands of such an army. I'm not even happy about being at the mercy of police forces. Let me tell you this. Down in Katanga province, a matter of a few weeks ago, the murder of the women and children in Katanga province, the assault on homes, and the murderous attack against uh, the capital of Katanga was being carried out by Indian troops of a world police force. How, my friends, would you like to see these same ravaging troops trying to enforce the processes of, of an international world program in the United States? I'll tell you that there's a few weapons they wouldn't confiscate, and there'll be dead troops littering the streets when they bring foreign troops in the United States, I pledge you. I tell you, the day they try to clap this down over this nation, all America is going to be a revolting institution of insurrection against the invaders of its liberty. So this is a part of the design, and they are trying to use the church. Mind this now, they're trying to use the church to sell people into surrendering their liberty, into assuming an economic responsibility for everybody in the world, for putting aside all weapons of every description and to try to tell you this is the program of God and because you're the church, you have to preach it. But I have a different Bible than they have. For he who created the earth and knows the nature of the enemy that has revolted that would take away its peace. He who placed you here to build his kingdom said to those disciples around him have been subject to his presence for over three years of perfect ministry soon to be endowed with his Holy Spirit and to move out with great spiritual power and to bear the message of the great militant spreading Christianity that was to reach out among all the nations with a white race and that speedily and specifically restricted in its first years to this move as the Apostle Paul told, was told that he was not to go into Asia but he had to stay within this area. Now listen, Jesus said to his disciples, have you got any swords? Now, there wasn't any other armament at that time outside of crossbows and longbows and pikes and spears, 
And he said, have you got any swords? And the disciple says, well, uh, no, we just have one sword, but we don't have many swords. Jesus said, I'm sending you out two by two. Now, if you don't have any swords, I see you've got coat. You'd be better off without your coat than without your sword. So if you don't have a sword, you better sell your coat and buy a sword. Because these people that hate you will kill you if they can. And you're going to need the swords. I'm sending you out just like lambs among wolves. And I want you able to protect yourself. That doesn't sound like the religious appeal that they're making now through the mail to all the clergy to get their all of uh, the nations and all of the peoples of Christians ready to surrender to a program of international control of world appeasement and advanced disarmament. I tell you that I'm not going to trust anybody Jesus didn't trust, and I've discovered that we've already trusted some of them too far that Jesus already denounced, and that's why we're in trouble. Now I turn to another phase. This is the economic phase. Probably there is no more dangerous design in the skilled warfare of our enemies who have been the masters of manipulating finance at every level than the economic phase of warfare. Here, as the false manipulators of world economy, they have created false impressions among the nations of the world as to what constitutes economic security. Now, I'm going to say this tonight that if you like gold, have it. If you like silver, have it. If you want to have solid coinage, have it. But don't let anybody ever sell you at any time on the fact that the economy of a great nation that produces its food and its skills uh, produce for it a technology surpassing anything the world has ever discovered. Don't let anybody tell you that the quantity of gold or silver you have or don't have should determine your prosperity or your survival. Probably one of the most foxious things that exists, and I find it active among great numbers of patriots, is the great fear that because of the drainage of gold or because of any of these things, we face a crisis that could end our economy. Yes, there is a danger only because the powers of darkness and the Luciferian forces have sold us on a false premise that we have to have any gold or any silver whatsoever. Now, someone said, well, Dr. Swift, don't you think that solid money is a standard of a symbol of a sound economy? If there's plenty of it around, but any economy that's built on scarcity is built on the wrong foundation to start with. For any time a successful people that can produce and create all the things and the necessities of life find themselves limping along on any substandard of economic level inside of their society, then you know that there's something intensely wrong, and it has to be in the areas of manipulation and the transfers of goods, and that falls back on an economy that's based on a foxish foundation. The kingdom of God is not founded on gold or silver. It's founded on intelligence and idea, intellect and energy. And only a nation that is devoid of this is bankrupt in the world today. I tell you that this key to intellectual power is a spiritual key. And a kingdom that or nation that is spiritually bankrupt is the poorest among all peoples, irrespective of how much it may gather together in what it calls gold or silver, and can find themselves starving for lack of food, can find themselves unable to supply the demands of their people, though their coffers be filled with gold and silver. This isn't a repudiation of gold, a repudiation of silver, but it is a repudiation of weighing out the value of a man by gold or silver. Or expending in thought the concept that the destiny of a great nation, or the great nations of God's kingdom, are utterly dependent upon this manipulating substance that has always found its way into the hands of the sacks of the international bankers of the earth. Someone said, oh, Dr. Swift, don't you think that the best thing you could have would be a sack of gold or a sack of silver? No, my friends, I think the best thing you could have is a good big piece of America. <laughs> they might steal and carry off your gold and silver, but nobody's going to carry off America. And by the grace of God, very few are going to step on it. And there's a whole lot of invaders that have come in that are going to go home or they're going to make fertilizer in our fields. <laughs> Say, that's not Christian. Well, my friends, it's God's idea, and he's got it all discussed here, even into plowing them under because of their destructive tactics concerning God's kingdom. Someone said, is that grace? Is that the love of God? Yes, because they'll be far easier to handle in the dimensions where they're going than they are here. So involved as they are with the selfish reactions of their dwelling in the flesh, 
it's a lot easier to get them where they're not so bothered by fleshly temptation. In the meantime, the kingdom of God can occupy, guided by the Spirit, to build a better world. We're faced with this fact that this economic key is one of the great master conspiracies of our time. It is by this conspiracy that they think they can frighten every individual, even the liberals, uh, are crying out to the conservatives, come and join us because it's your life and your substance also that's involved. Throughout the days of the New Deal and throughout the periods that followed it under Mr. Truman and under the periods uh, of Mr. Eisenhower's administration, we watched a gradual development of socialism. We watched the departments and branches of our government can gain uh, a strategy of gaining more and more control over every phase of American life. And they were buying this ability by promising they were going to regulate it because it had gotten out of hand. It needed regulation by saying that if they could regulate it, they would also subsidize the individual and see that he had economic and social security. They promised this security if you would surrender your independence. And I challenge that America was sold by the voices of the president that said, my friends, you have nothing to fear but fear itself. And I tell you, the thing you had most to fear were the advisors around this man whose desire for power and whose concept that he could take care of everything his own way were one of America's most dangerous symbols. I want you to know that this is much, as much prophetic and as much a part of the Bible as any passage as we can read because we are a great nation of God's kingdom. Upon this nation rests the greatest responsibility of any nation in the Western world. We may talk about the tremendous comeback and the great creative abilities of other nations of the Western world, but the processes and the operations were tied and geared to your economy to make this thing possible. And only the leadership upon the part of a nation like this one under God properly balanced can become the basic resistance to the advance of the world Soviet program. Now, of course, there is always great problems poised by tyrannies. Tyrannies that have massive control over manpower and understand the principal laws of economic competition and understand also the strategies and controls as does every Marxist society knew they had in the vast manpowers of the rushes the ability to compete in areas of essential items to which the economies of all nations were geared. Their desire was not the supply of the desires of their people, but first to gain that economic mastery and that unbalance inside of society. And so the massive programs of Soviet production in certain areas went into effect. Their gold production has been quite expansive in the Lake Bacali regions and far out in the steppes. Great placer areas that are, are like those of northern Siberia, locked with vast amounts of placer gold and raw gold, have made unlimited gold wealth fall into the hands of the Soviet Union. Besides this also, they have geared themselves to the development and control, and even the military expansion is prepared for more expansion areas of control in areas over gold, over oil, and other materials. And while their own people do not have transportation systems that you have unavailable, the purchase of the automobiles that are available to you, nor the use of such materials as oil in their economy, the material they do have as oil is transported here and there in the world to undersell the production costs in the free world and to bring down their economy and weaken it by this policy. Their own people are told these are things are being denied to you because of the impending threat of the great free world to crush the Soviet Union. And after we have become victorious and the world has become socialist and the hammer and sickle flies over one end of the world to the other, then you can have the spoil of the nations and there will be given to you all the things you've sacrificed during this hour. And don't you underestimate this. From one end of the Soviet world to the other, people are being asked to sacrifice and to deny themselves in order that they might become powerful and strong to crush all the competitive resistance and break down all the systems of the Western world. They haven't given up one point of that from the beginning. There has been no concession made at any peace table concerning permitting security to the opponent. Only the other day that Mr. Rust made a speech in that speech, Mr. Russ said, we are prepared to go very, very far in ensuring peace. We're willing to assume great economic responsibilities in helping to stabilize the peoples of all over the world. 
we're willing to assist even communist countries if they show a willingness to become recipient and with goodwill to our favors. Then he said, we are willing also to guarantee programs of disarmament even beyond security measures. We're willing to even trust them beyond that that might be considered wise and advisable to bring about peace. Now, I want to tell you that this is where I say they've gone already too far. Anytime they say we've gone beyond the values of proper security measures, anytime we've already offered a program that's unrealistic to the point of creating for us a great hazard, then, my friends, we shouldn't have advanced that far as time to get rid of the Secretary of State. <laughs> At this moment, we discover again that in this Trade Expansion Act, which was passed by the Congress in in. Uh, June, over 301 congressmen voted for that bill. In fact, of the 301 congressmen that voted for that bill, the amazing thing is that uh, there was only 130 that voted against it. Now you say, what was that bill? That bill took out of the hands of Congress its congressional responsibility of fixing the tariffs and regulating the trade between nations and passed it over into the hands of the sorriest president we've ever had in the United States. And if the Senate does the same, you have become speedily a dictatorship under a socialist band of advisors that will speedily be patterned like that of the Soviet. I want to tell you that inside the clauses of this great master trap was the suggestion that the need of our day was to expand trade, to expand industry, to gradually replace the war industries as we moved into the braver newer area uh, by opening up such areas of production for all the world that we would expand free trade everywhere. And everybody that came out for free trade, and all the liberals as well as conservatives that were now told that we we're in dire business plight. There isn't any doubt we're in a dire business plight. But it isn't because of tariffs, my friends, it's because of a lack of them. We're in a dire business plight, but it's not because of the inability of America to produce or consume. It's because of the inability of our administrative leaders to understand the fundamental principles of Christian society and American business. It's because the president had another name for businessmen that would disqualify them as his associates. Listen. I looked at some of this propaganda before it was being passed out to congressmen everywhere. I knew that the Trade Expansionist Act was a deadly one. I didn't think that the Congress of the United States would be foolish enough to surrender their traditional and historic and constitutional control, which is an unconstitutional factor, to subject that control into the hands of one man, an executive, an executive as poorly advised as this one. The President of the United States, under this policy also, has the power to abolish without any hindrance, any tariff, can make any agreement with any foreign power, can uh, make any type of economic association between you and the world market or any other block of nations on the face of the earth. All you say, but if you take down this tariff, it's going to hurt American industry. Some factories can't compete now with the world scale and the production scale, and it's going to hurt. Yes, it's going to hurt. And it's going to lay a lot of men off. Yes, it's going to lay a lot of men off. But Congress was told the act takes care of that. It provides that the United States government can compensate the factories and reconstruct and expand their productive areas to any factory that turns closed down. It also says that it can take any person that's unemployed and compensate them for their loss for wages and salary during the period of time that they're unemployed because of the, uh, the related factors of this act and the abolitions of tariffs. So let me show you how unprecedented in its power it goes for the president to take of the Treasury of the United States and give it anywhere he chooses. It says that this power goes back to 1934. And anybody since 1934 that's been hurt by tariffs or by regulations of government tariffs can be compensated as the president determines they should be, factories or individuals. And this would place in his power absolute and final control over the economy of your nation. The other day I saw a large article that was prepared for the consumption of United States Senators and also parts of it published in Eastern newspapers. 
I saw evaluation in the historic New York Times that carries forward the international boondoggling program producing one world state. And it is said that the inability of American industry at the present time to compete with the productive standards of the world are based, of course, upon the high cost of our goods, now shut off, of course, by the tariffs we have and the tariffs they're forced to place on our goods in order to protect their own trade. Let me tell you why America is in trouble. One of the reasons why the American businessman can't compete you go back before World War II, you'll discover that the United States government had the highest wage standard in the world. You'll discover that we paid more to produce something than they paid for it anywhere in the world. And you'll discover that we sold it to America, too. And when we got through selling it to America, the world still came and bought it. You say, how was that? We had tariffs because we produced goods in quantity and we produced goods the world wanted and the best place to get it was here. But now let me point out to you something. At the end of World War II, the international money changer had finally managed to set Christian nation against Christian nation and to sow misunderstanding and vicious uh, lies in the presses of the world until they thought they'd sowed a division between the white nations of the Western world. And during the policies of such war, they utilized your bombers and the instruments of your military strength to destroy areas of the earth that they wanted to destroy and thus thought that they were broke, breaking for all time the barrier that would stop the hordes of Asia from sweeping the rest of Europe and eventually encircling you. And then when the war was over and the areas of the Western world were somewhat in ruin, some people learned what General Patton paid with his life the truth to know. And that was that we might have fought the wrong war at the wrong time under the wrong circumstances. And learn that one of the most dangerous situations of the world now would be for us to leave a weakened Central Europe for the ravaging hordes of Asia and communism to come in on. Now you want to know why the American businessman has a hard job without tariffs competing for the home market? I'll tell you why. Because we tax the American businesses and the American businessmen to rebuild every broken business in Europe. We build every factory, we build it with new machinery and with fine equipment. We put every one of the nations of Western Europe back in business. And we tax the American businessman struggling to survive to do it. Then we subsidize the development of his business. And having done this, we gave economic aid that ran into billions of dollars, and we taxed the businessman for this. Having financed all of his economic competitors, having reconstructed their factories, and having financed their, everything that related to the development of their business program, he now had to produce, under the heavy processes of taxation, the goods that he could sell at a point where he could compete with theirs and still support them to produce the goods they were competing with him for. This was the era. I do not say that America didn't have a certain responsibility associated with keeping Western Europe and its economy out of the hands of world communism. But I want you to know also that in the development and in the creation of uh, this area of society, we should have learned one lesson, that the best market in the world was the market of these United States. Now we point out to you that the international banker has watched one uh, development which happened with greater speed than he anticipated. That was the common market of the lowland countries in Germany and so forth inside of Europe. Its sudden strength and economic prosperity. Then the international banker used his influences to get his hand inside the picture. Pressure was being brought on the United States to force us to break down all barriers. And if we thus broke down all barriers and joined by treaty, the common market, we were told, that the economic solution to America's economic woes would now be met in Honda. Now I want you to know that Britain inside the Commonwealth system was faring well. The Commonwealth received the raw materials from one part of it to another, and they manufactured the goods in the aisles, or in Australia they would make some things, and they would transport raw materials to some other part of the Commonwealth, and thus these nations had their own trading program with which their economies were successful. The international banker manipulating under the great economic pressure of the United States, 
brought the pressure to bear on Britain that she would have to also dump the Commonwealth system and get inside the common market. And this is well known. Washington knows that the pressure is on from the heads of our government, from our State Department, to smash the Commonwealth system of the British Empire, which has been almost indestructible as far as sustaining the internal economies of these countries. Now we point out to you that the president has the authority to move us in. You say, why do the internationalists want to get us into a common market? Because the moment you get into a common market, you have to have common financing. And they know that through the International and World Bank, they will then accomplish the complete control of every nation that's in it. And along with it, the president and the others are talking about federating us now into a great inter-United States of Europe and America and eventually the world. The moment you surrender your economic and your monetary independence, you no longer can determine your own destiny. And what your forefathers fought and died for when they made a declaration of independence and predicated this nation on permanent liberty has been all sacrificed in one hour. And if the Senate of the United States passes this bill called this Great Expansion Act of 1962, every man that votes for it is guilty of treason to these United States. Conspiracy is all set. The international world program has been so designed, and therefore they are seeking to put you at the mercy of all of these areas. Now it's totally impossible. Unless you can have the American market for this to be accomplished any other way. Speaking in New York to businessmen and to the uh, nation's uh, industrial leaders, the President of the United States admitted that we had given six billion dollars to the development of Europe and to the defense systems. And he said because of this tremendous uh, six billion dollar gift at that time, he said we have given out over three billion dollars a year in the last two years and the rate we're going now it's, it's three billion a year. Now he said we can't stand this of course uh, as far as the balance of gold is concerned because it goes out faster than we can get it in. So we've got to increase the amount of business we do in order that we can get back a proper balance of this goal. And this means we've got to join the great world trading program and get American business back into the vast export business all over the world. And then he had to admit that what we had been doing was not a sound financial policy, but we, it was a policy that we were committed to and we couldn't stop. And I can tell you that one of the biggest rat holes in which you have been pouring your money has been into Poland and into Yugoslavia and into communist countries and into the support of areas which you're told are friendly communist countries. There's only one kind of communist. Now it is the same strategy. We point out to you now that America, if this passes, will find ourselves flooded with commodities while factories close down. This is another threat, so the only solution, they tell us, is that we now move into a great world-responsible, economically-minded government program that the great new constitutionalist conventions for a world constitution have worked out these details. The elimination of tariffs and the modulation of the flow of goods and the finding of markets for the production of the capacity of any nation to see that their goods are properly distributed is guaranteed. But you know it doesn't say anything about remuneration? Not one word. What do you mean remuneration? There is no remuneration in a socialist state. Everybody works and distributes it everywhere. And you only get back your percentage out of the whole world's distribution of the goods. Like that? That's what they're offering you behind the honeyed phrases of your Christian responsibility. They would tell you it's your job to support the devil. Now, I can't find any instructions anywhere in the Bible where we're supposed to support the devil in his works or where we're to be penalized to accomplish this job. Had God decided to bless them with all the bounty that they could be supplied with from the natural blessings of earth, he would have accomplished this. But he hasn't and will not bless those uh, that despise his name and worship the darkness and live in superstition. I think that it's obvious to you tonight that none of the communist world can compete with you in food production. They can't even produce enough to eat that they could not compete with you in the technological achievements of the hour if they hadn't stolen with their Jewish spies your nuclear and your uh, astronautical wisdom. 
They had to steal from you your secrets. That's why their spy system. And then they have launched to certain areas what are the evidences of technological achievement beyond that which you would have expected. But without the assistance of Anglo-Saxon, German, Scandinavian brains, they could never have accomplished it. And by these held captive, they made their strides. Leave me other no mistake tonight. With all who superior cutting, they are building up for a master play. Someone said if the world government forms, will that not also regulate the Soviet Union? It'll be de -dom dominated by the creators of the Soviet Union. And their manpower will become your police force. Can you imagine any objective carried out in the world to enforce the law in which a Soviet officer was still in charge? Well, that's the guarantee. Yes, this is the master trap tonight. That you'll not be able to buy nor sell, except you accept the mark. Now, I have noticed lately punity pieces of literature with semi-quasi governmental authorship. Punity pieces of literature concerning the obstructionists, the narrow-minded individuals who are mentally unbalanced and are not ready for the social progress of this age, of the great need of a treatment and mental assistance and proper psychological development and adjustment for those that are out of step. It's about time you manage to put all the rest of Christian America out of step before there is enough of them to give you the special treatment to get you in step. Already I think there's too many to treat for 31% of 145 million free, 190 million free Americans have already found it out. They don't know all these facts. The one thing they don't understand is this economic conspiracy. I noticed the newspapers of the uh, Central West this last few days, why they were rejoicing over the fact that we were going to give a billion, six hundred million dollars worth of necessary food, where we're going to sell these foods. The Soviet communist countries could have the food. And they seemed utterly devoid of the realization that we were going to tax America a billion to six hundred thousand dollars to give this food to them. And we weren't going to get anything back. I want you to know that the record shows that we have already subsidized the world by extending them the money to buy the goods that we've been giving out in foreign trade. And you say, look at how much good we moved the farmers' goods, we're moving the goods to our factories, and you're not only paying to produce it, but you're giving them the money to buy it with, and then you're taxing the whole nation to provide it, and no one's getting out from under it, including you. I point out that the kingdom of God is based on something more intelligent than that. There never was a design to produce in great excess beyond necessity. You know, life is more than working. Did you know that? Life is more than accumulating pieces of paper or chunks of gold and silver. Life is time to live it. Life, my friends, under divine blessing, takes less effort to produce more good. And the smarter you get, the more freedom you should have for research and for enjoyment and for uh, appreciating the vastness of God's creation, its outdoors, and all the things that are involved. For the expansion of the relationship with the members of the family, more hours for spiritual service, and for the increase in divine knowledge. More time, time that's yours as God lifts the curse by restoring to you technological know-how, and you harness the earth to do your work. But you don't have to compete with the world to get any amount of gold, silver, or paper. Wake up. The best market in the world is the American market. I'd like to see a tariff wall so high that nobody could afford to send anything in unless, my friends, that it was so far above the American cost of production that the person that can afford to buy it on the outside because they like it that way will pay the price. Someone said, well, there are a few items that are made better over there. If they're made better over there, it's because this slovenly approach of the last 30 years have taken away the pride of engineering skill and the pride of craftsmanship for a lust for money that men thought would be easily squandered. And I tell you today, if there's anything that we're being chastised for, it's because we lost the skill for mass cheap production in an hour where everybody was wrestling for control of money but losing by the same policy their own market. How many times have you heard people say, well, I'd buy it here, but this product from over there is better made and better finished. You want to know who to blame for that? Blame the labor demagogues for that. Blame Mystery Babylon. Someone said, well, we have to cheapen the goods. America will pay the price. America would pay the price if the goods had the same quality. But I want you to know that this is something that you must understand. 
God has ordained that you are not to associate yourselves with the Babylonian order on the world level. You are not to subject the American economy to the standards with which your competitors can plunge it down lower than that of the uh, skilled labor in the poorest paid country of earth. So the only thing is to remember that the facts now show that the only thing that you're really paid for are the goods you've sold America as they pay it with the money they earn producing the goods. And if any other idea exists in your mind that wealth is by piling up some strange substance with which men trade, that you're very, very foolish. Because all men trade for are promises of goods that mean hours of work, a skilled artisan, and a raw material. Now, when you get through, this nation has large amounts of raw material, and we have skilled artisans, and we have craftsmen, and we have men, and we can produce. And if we can produce more we need in three days a week, then that's all in the, the hours we need to work, unless the world's willing to buy our goods at our price. If not, there is nothing that you can't produce here. Back in those early days of American history, one of the things our statesmen pointed out was how strong this nation could become with self-security. It never, my friends, made the foreign market more valuable than the home one. And I point out to you that in this hour in which you live, it was understood that this was the strongest area of national security. And so your nation became strong. There was practically nothing that America needs that it doesn't and can't produce here at home. I have watched the destructive factors since World War II move in, and I've watched the discouragement by government of American mining. I watched them close down the essential uh, minerals that make you now dependent largely on the far-flung mineral deposits of the world, that make you have to subsidize other people's labor markets instead of your own. I have watched, and so have you, uh, the condition in which we buy it at a higher price than we would pay for it here at home, and the government does the buying, and then the government sells it to industry cheaper than can be produced. So America dislocates American production. And I want you to know that America and any great nation becomes strong when that nation becomes independent. And you will become a greater supporter of the policies of freedom to your neighbor when you're strong. Remember this. That if everybody in your block is independent, if everybody in your block is supporting himself, you have a stronger society than if one of you are supporting everybody on the block and they're all on your payroll because they don't have work. Someone says we have to be interrelated to have success economically. We've got to be interdependent. No, my friends, the greatest success comes from independence. I point out to you tonight that Satan has tried to make you interdependent. He's trying to tell the kingdom of God you can't live without us. He's trying to say you have to tie yourself to his system and God says come out among them and be separate and segregated. And I don't want you to have any association with the pagans. I don't want you tied to their economy. I don't want you to hinge any of your necessities upon their production. I want you to know tonight that the day America reaffirms its faith in our Father and the Declaration of Independence that he inspired our forefathers to write with every ability and every right to go to the assistance when we so desire of any other Christian nation or any design that we might have to loan or assist those nations where their means are and design is right and just. But I want you to know that this arbitrary international power that can take from every American citizen that becomes your master that can disarm you by nation or by individual and put you at the mercy of five-sixths of the pagan world that could outvote you is the program of Antichrist. And God says yes, and they will see that you have to have the right card or you will even be able to get your groceries down at the grocery store when you go to buy. No man would be able to buy except he had the mark and the approval of this beast system, which means the world political system of the forces which are against God and his kingdom. I could go back to that religious facet with it comes another additional panel of idea, and that idea is that you don't have to embrace nor recognize that God himself is alone the one God, but ask you in order to relieve the tension to the world to respect every man's gods and all men's religions. And God says, if you do that, I'm ashamed of you. If you do it long enough, I'll just fan your britches until you stop this thing. <laughs> I'm going to tell you tonight that all the trouble you're getting into, and you're getting some chastising, 
has come from the violation of God's law, not eschewing the error. And again, I can't help but feel that God Almighty is going to stimulate a great awakening. And on every Christian is a great basic responsibility. This time every Christian wrote his senator, and it's time every Christian made all those around the body know how he feels because of this association with strategies uh, that are not good for us. Someone says that a Christian isn't supposed to influence government. A Christian better make himself heard and felt in government because this is his responsibility. But I tell you that every Christian has duty bound to preserve these United States. And any transaction upon the part of your government that would surrender that independence is everybody's business. And they better get into it quickly. So I tell you that this is the big pressure. They want to get this thing right out. Within the next few uh, weeks, this thing may occur. It may start at any moment now. The pressure is on. They want the Senate now to ratify this Trade Expansion Act of 1962. It's already gone through the House. There's great fears they'll get through. If it goes through, then I'm going to tell you that your economic life and the control of your nation and your assured expansion to a world government losing your power is inevitable and only the great explosion of light, truth, and dynamic power can save America. And you might be praying before long, God give us a military hunter that would set us free. Someone says, well, what does the scripture say? God Almighty said, this is the time of Jacob's trouble. He tells you that this is the hour of crisis and that you're going to have to cleanse America. And the more quickly you cleanse America and find the route to do that, the more quickly you're going to be free from all the satanic influence that charges our land. Yes, I can look down the road beyond this to glory. I can behold the majesty of Christ as he walked the earth, the majesty of Christ as he walks the earth again, never paralleled in all his praise. I can see the great satanic conspiracy, and I can see the tremendous array of spiritual powers and the hosts of heaven and all of your celestial relatives, and I can see the mighty victory of God's kingdom as he stimulates the intellect of that race in a moment, the twinkling of an eye to come to itself. I can see all the white world coming to itself like Britain did a few weeks ago when it decided it was going to suddenly make Britain white and sweep out everything it couldn't absorb. One of these days, America is going to determine that this also was a white Christian nation. Go back to the concepts of our founding fathers and we're going to sweep this nation so clean and scrub it so white that its white destiny will never be doubted again. One of these days, the most prosperous society in the world will be America with interest-free money, with a value established by the United States Congress and not manipulated by any international banker at any corner of the world. And we will be sending international bankers to conventions in Geneva and conventions over inside the Soviet Union. Let every man look to his own house. And our house will be free. Yes, sir, matter, uh, don't put any trust in money because the only thing you can put trust in is the vision, the inspiration, the creative ability of your race and the bounty of the land which God has blessed you with. And out of it will come security that God has promised to supply that no one in the world can take with them or take from you.